internet friends. In this video, I am reading a chapter straight out of my new book, The Deep State Encyclopedia. The book is available to purchase in the link in the description, both in print and digital form. And I don't know how long this video is going to stay up on my channel, given that I'm about to talk about the things that you're not allowed to talk about on YouTube. So if you want to read more, if you want to know more, about dangerous information and stories that have been censored off the internet, I have all that and more in my book. I also have my videos backed up on my website and you can also find me on places like Gab and the other channels who don't censor the same things that YouTube does. So, you know, the whole spiel, I'll just get to it. This is House of Rockefeller. One of the richest and most influential families in American history is the Rockefeller family. John D. Rockefeller Sr., who was born in New York in 1839, built the family fortune. America's first billionaire, John D. was son of William Rockefeller Sr., otherwise known as Devil Bill, an American businessman, lumberman, herbalist, salesman, snake oil salesman, and con artist. Devil Bill first worked as a lumberjack before becoming a traveling salesman selling elixirs and posing as a botanic physician under the pseudonym Dr. William Levingston. His son, John D., started out in the oil business as a bookkeeper and later as a partner in a refinery company. He established the Standard Oil Company in 1870 and it grew to be one of the biggest and most successful oil companies in the whole world. The ruthless business practices of John D. Rockefeller Sr. included monopolizing the oil industry, undercutting rivals, and buying off politicians and government officials. The son of John D. Rockefeller Sr., John D. Rockefeller Jr., carried on his father's financial legacy as he was involved in a number of commercial and charitable endeavors, such as the construction of New York City's Rockefeller Center and the founding of the Rockefeller Foundation. Nelson Rockefeller, who served as Vice President of the United States under President Gerald Ford and as Governor of New York, is another notable member of the Rockefeller family. And then, of course, we arrive at American banker David Rockefeller, who held the positions of Chairman and CEO of the Chase Manhattan Corporation. David here was the longest living grandchild of John D. Rockefeller and served as Chairman of the Chase Manhattan Bank and founder of the Trilateral Commission which is very similar to the Bilderberg Group, just a different flavor. The wealth and power of the Rockefeller family has also been the subject of debate and scandal. Government investigations and antitrust lawsuits focused on the family's business practices, particularly those of John D. Rockefeller Sr. And as a result, the Standard Oil Company was split up in 1911 by the U.S. Supreme Court after it was determined that it had engaged in monopolistic practices. With its official narrative of promoting greater collaboration and understanding between Western Europe, North America, and Japan, Deep State agent David Rockefeller co-founded the Trilateral Commission in 1973. 
true to the globalist mindset, David Rockefeller believed increased cooperation between these territories was essential for fostering stability and tackling global issues. So the Trilateral Commission is not a government organization on paper. Its members are not elected, they're chosen. And basically, the Trilateral Commission, which contains former and present government officials, business executives, and, and intellectual luminaries from all over the world as members, serves as a shadowy cabal working behind the scenes to influence events and forward its own agenda. Prompted by Ida Tarbell's expose of the Rockefeller oil monopoly, the Rockefellers decided to enhance their public relations to boost their reputation. So John D. Sr. and John D. Jr. and Frederick Taylor Gates founded the Rockefeller Foundation on May 14, 1913. 1913 was a crazy year. Like birth of the ADL, Federal Reserve, Rockefeller Foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation has historically provided more than 14 billion to thousands of grantees around the world and directly helped train close to 13,000 Rockefeller Fellows. But this money was used to take over the medical industry, including hospitals, universities, and research centers starting in the first half of the 20th century. You see, the Rockefeller family supported drug-based research by sponsoring it and giving money to colleges and medical schools. Through their International Education Board, they further expanded this policy to foreign medical institutions and universities, where the research involved the use of drugs. On the flip side, non-drug-based institutions and research were denied financing and were abandoned in favor of the lucrative pharmaceutical sector. Because natural remedies and healthy people don't make any money. It's not a good business model. The 1910 Flexner Report to the U.S. Congress quickly criminalized the Foundation's rivals. A post-Civil War United States gave rise to the titans of industry's glory days. The robber barons filled their bags during this era at the expense of the common people. In 1892, a big labor dispute happened at the Carnegie Steel Company plant in Homestead, Pennsylvania known as the Carnegie Steel Company Homestead Strike. At the time, Andrew Carnegie was one of the wealthiest people in the country, and the Carnegie Steel Company was one of the biggest and most profitable steel companies in the world. The workers at the Homestead plant wanted to negotiate a new contract with the company that would give them better pay and working conditions. These factories were dangerous. Workers labored under abysmal conditions for little pay. But instead of negotiating with the workers like a decent person, Carnegie hired the Pinkerton Detective Agency to quell the unrest, leading to a violent battle between the Pinkertons and the strikers. The situation resulted in deaths of men, women, and children at the hands of the Pinkertons. And eventually, the National Guard was called in to intervene. Much like the Carnegies, the Rockefellers had a similar peasant revolt in which they hired private security to settle the unrest resulting in the death of innocents. A Ludlow massacre happened in 1914 in the town of Ludlow, Colorado. It was a fight between coal miners on strike and the Colorado National Guard. Miners went on strike against coal mining companies, including those owned by the Rockefeller family, to get better working conditions, fair wages, and recognition of their union. When the National Guard was called in to keep order, they started shooting at the striking miners and their families, who were living in the tents in the nearby colony. Dozens of people, including women and children, died because of the fight. It was a turning point in the history of labor relations in the United States. Much like with the Homestead Strike, the Ludlow Massacre made people all over the country aware of how bad the industrialists were to their workers, painting families like the Rockefellers and the Carnegies in an incredibly negative light. But why should those who see themselves as gods among men have to deal with the criticism of the common people, the poor workers who were so far below them? The Rockefellers and the Carnegies set aside their differences and came together to fund a new initiative. In 1904, the Carnegie Institution set up a lab complex at Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island, New York. Researchers carefully planned the removal of families, bloodlines, and entire groups of people by collecting millions of index cards about ordinary Americans. Edwin Black wrote for the San Francisco Chronicle in 2003, quote, From Cold Spring Harbor, eugenics advocates agitated the legislature of America, as well as the nation's social service agencies and associations, end quote. 
The Salem Daily Capital Journal ran an article on November 4, 1915 entitled, Rockefeller Jr. on Eugenic Problems which detailed a play commissioned by the Rockefellers called The Unborn, which pushed a eugenics agenda. For the first time in dramatic history, the perplexing problem of limitation of undesirable offspring, which has been engaging the attention of thoughtful eugenicists and sociologists the world over, is dealt with on the stage in a play that we are to produce. The right of the child to be well born and the right of the wife to decide about it are problems the solution of which society can no longer ignore." End quote. Notice Rockefeller Jr. uses the terms undesirable and well born. And as a side note, thank you so much Truthstream Media for having these articles on your website and making them accessible to us uh, when they're, they can no longer be found on the internet. Without Truthstream's research, a lot of this stuff on Rockefeller would have been forgotten. A few months later, on September 3rd, 1915, the Rockefellers once again made headlines for their extracurricular eugenics activities, this time in the Washington Herald, in an article entitled 15 Million Americans Defective, They Say, with the subheader reading, Gigantic Eugenic Enterprise Organized for Sterilization of Unfit of Nation. The Washington Herald article discusses the collaboration between John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, Andrew Graham Bell, the, the inventor of the telephone, and the wife of the railroad baron, E. H. Harriman. The article discusses that since 1911, the eugenicists were funding a gigantic eugenic enterprise to ascertain what is the matter with the human race. The article ends with, quote, the organization, after his four years' work in this country and Europe, reached the conclusion that sterilization of defectives was the greatest work for them. Statistics gathered reveal the amazing fact that 10% of the present population of the United States are defectives, who must be blotted out as reproducers of human life." End quote. It should be noted that the Rockefellers had a close relationship with Margaret Sanger, a proponent of eugenics in the U.S., who had a significant impact on Western legislation and practice regarding contraception, sex education, abortion, and the development of eugenics in the 20th century. So just to wrap it all up here, the most powerful and wealthiest families in America conspired together after the Civil War to derail our nation's monetary system by creating the Federal Reserve at Jekyll Island in 1913, and by funding the practice of eugenics all over the world in an effort to kill the poor in huge numbers. The Rockefellers were at the heart of this effort, and while they were funding the push to destabilize the United States and kill off undesirables, they were simultaneously pioneering the medical industry resulting in the profit-driven system we know today, which doesn't benefit from a healthy individual, only individuals who constantly require pharmaceuticals. Rockefeller observed that there were numerous medical specialties and therapeutic approaches available at the turn of the century, including chiropractic, naturopathy, homopathy, holistic therapy, herbal medicine, and more. So Rockefeller hired Abraham Flexner to present a report to Congress in 1910 to discredit rivals of Western medicine who then recommended drugs and radiation as treatments. This research concluded that America had an excess of medical professionals and medical colleges, and that all forms of natural medicine that had been practiced for hundreds or even thousands of years were unreliable quackery. It demanded that medical education be standardized and that only the American Medical Association be permitted to license medical schools in the U.S. The result was the establishment of the biomedical model as the gold standard of medical training. Thus, the Rockefeller Foundation and Rockefeller Medicine became the face of Western medicine. Through their philanthropy, I'm doing air quotes when I say philanthropy, and funding of medical research, the Rockefeller family has made a significant contribution to the development of modern medicine, for better or for worse. The founding of the first School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland was one of the most significant contributions made by the Rockefeller Foundation. This institution, which opened its doors in 1916, was the first of its kind in the country. Much of the vaccine development was at the hands of the Rockefeller Foundation. Eugenics was rebranded after World War II to get rid of its links to Germany and Hitler. 
Instead, it evolved into population control or Planned Parenthood's family planning and abortion, and even global warming or climate change leading to arguments about reducing the burden of overpopulation on the Earth. In its annual report for 1968, the Rockefeller Foundation said that it had helped fund the development of so-called anti-fertility vaccines, as well as their widespread use. The Rockefeller Foundation claimed it was important to learn about the possibility of using vaccines to reduce male fertility. In that poverty, we hate the poor people, lack of education, we hate the uneducated, and lack of work, we hate the lazy people, are made worse by unchecked birth rates among the poor, both in suburban slums and in poor rural areas. So an anti-fertility vaccine needed to be created to combat these issues. Since 5 million women were living in poverty in the United States at the time of publication, don't you just love their whole problem reaction solution? 20 years later in 1988, the Rockefeller Foundation released an update on their anti-fertility vaccine development. That year, the National Institute of Immunology in India had finished the first phase of testing with three versions of a vaccine for women that would stop them from getting pregnant. The trials, which were paid for by the Indian government and the Rockefeller Foundation, found that each of the vaccines tested could protect against pregnancy for at least, at least one year, based on the levels of antibodies that were made in response to the vaccination schedule. But like with all vaccines, there needed to be studies on the effects of the vaccination on an individual throughout their lifetime to measure if the vaccines were really safe and effective. And there were and are no studies to support their safety over a lifetime. In its 1985 annual report, the Rockefeller Foundation showed that it was still working hard to make sure undesirables couldn't reproduce. And they were researching Gossipol or C30 H30 08, a substance that prevents fertility. Early on in the foundation's research, Gossipol, a toxic polyphenol made from the cotton plant, was found to be a good sterilant. Who knew? The next natural question was how to put the poisonous substance into the crops so unsuspecting people would eat it and therefore they wouldn't re reproduce. By the end of 1985, the foundation had given out grants worth about $1.6 million to support and encourage scientific research into the safety and effectiveness of this substance. Throughout the 1990s, the Rockefellers continued their anti-fertility research. However, the foundation became very hush-hush about their doings in the face of widespread criticism. And that's the end of the chapter on the Rockefellers, but the book goes into further detail about the Rockefellers and their involvement in public school education their involvement in the 1918 Spanish flu, which really wasn't a flu at all. It was more like a pandemic among the vaccinated. The book goes further into Operation Lockstep and its connection with COVID-19 and the Rockefellers. Rockefellers and the Federal Reserve, the creature from Jekyll Island, we got it all covered here in this book. It is very exhaustive and I hope you can appreciate the effort because like I said, like with Truthstream, they've been such a wonderful resource for all things Rockefeller on their website and in their videos. They've gone above and beyond and making sure there's archives of Rockefeller articles and things like that. And a big portion of why I wanted to write this book is to document, you know, what we've seen, what we've read, and what we've witnessed because a big portion of the information that we're left with is online and the information, the whole flow of information online is being totally erased. Ever since I sat down in 2016 and started writing a journal, keeping notes of everything that I wanted to commit to memory, these families, these events, the hidden history, mystery religions, occultism, hermeticism, everything that these people believe in and what drives them and motivates them, I would write down and I would link sources. And now I go back in those notes as I was writing this whole book. Those sources are gone. These mainstream media sources and quotes and videos, they're all gone. They're gone. Everything has become so censored and I think we need to put what we know into print. Even though this book contains story after story of evil doings performed in secret and against the American people in much of the world, I'll tell you person to person that I'm a realist, but at my core, I'm an optimist. I believe that through educating the masses and encouraging awareness of these issues, we can once again reclaim our freedom and declare victory over the cabal.
Hey internet friends, chances are if you've spent any amount of time trying to figure out how the world really operates, you've stumbled upon the name Rothschild a time or two during your travels. While Rothschild isn't a household name like Bush or Clinton, the Rothschilds play a lead role on the global stage. But unlike our political figureheads, we have no say in their rule, much less a say in how they rule. In fact, what I've noticed is that if you even dare suggest that the Rothschilds or any other family or corporation is playing puppeteer, you'll get labeled an anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist at some point in your venture. But in an effort to reveal what was once hidden, let us cast away the fear of being laughed at or shunned. This won't be an exhaustive video on the Rothschilds, but if you're new around here, I hope to give you enough information to spark your interest so you'll do your own research. And maybe, in a not too distant future, we can all work together to formulate some solutions. Some peaceful solutions. While not the only ruling body near the top of the pyramid, the House of Rothschild, their Jesuit handlers, and most importantly, the driving force behind their actions, are all certainly worthy of discussion, don't you think? The real owners, the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. The Rothschilds claim to be a wealthy Jewish banking family that got their start in 1760 when Mayor Rothschild established his banking dynasty and sent his five sons to foreign countries to continue the family business. At least that's what the majority of their published story claims, but this is just one token in a jingling coin purse of tricks. The story of the House of Rothschild begins long before the 18th century. The Rothschilds are Khazar Jews who converted to Judaism but never made the full conversion. While this is a sensitive and complicated matter to research and discuss, much less, if you follow the Bible, take note that the Bible warns of fake Jews not once, but twice. Another tip-off is that their name isn't really Rothschild. The family did the old switcheroo and changed from Bauer to Rothschild, using the red shield outside their residence as inspiration for their new identity. Rothschild, German for red shield. Here's where the published history usually begins. After establishing himself as a banker through a series of tactics like offering rare coins and treasure at a discount to nobility, Mayor Rothschild secured himself as a member in the in crowd, getting in good with the Prince of Germany by assisting with his Renatroop business. And as a court Jew, he lent money and handled the finances of the nobility. And when Mayor Rothschild sent his five sons to expand their family business to London, Paris, Frankfurt, Vienna, and Naples, their banks caught on by using a system where you could go deposit your gold at a Rothschild bank in one country, get a receipt for it, take that receipt to another country, and withdraw your gold so during your travels you wouldn't be separated from what is yours by theft or any other misfortune. And while that was a pretty novel idea, it's important to note that a key function of banks in general is to offer loans and charge interest. That's how they profit. But when this system goes unregulated and the bankers assess a desperate need for money, thus charging an exorbitant interest rate to loan out that money, that's when things go south. Because when a person or a government is faced with the prospect of either losing human life or taking on interest for a loan, well, most folks are going to go the interest route since human life is priceless. The ideology or motivation behind this greed is one of the major factors of how we got here today. That's the basic foundation, but let's get to the real meat and potatoes of the story. The wavering moral compass that led to immense wealth. While the Rothschilds had a hand in the opium and slave trades, the City of London's central banking system, counterfeit money, and the French Revolution, I told y'all this was going to be an accelerated history. I don't want y'all to have to sip from your camelbacks and slip on a pair of Depends to watch a single video of mine, so let's move on to the Rothschilds' funding of American colonies, their role in the American Civil War, and the series of events that led to the creation of the big kicker, the Federal Reserve. The American Civil War was financed by the House of Rothschild, 
they backed both sides. And throughout this video, you'll notice this trend. The funding of both sides stirs and finances the hatred for both sides. And since war is profit, especially when bankers are the ones who profit from the loans the government takes out, at one point, Abraham Lincoln needed more money. And the rates he was offered by the New York bankers were too high. Thus, he began printing government money. Take note that this money, unlike the money issued by the Federal Reserve today, collected no interest. Thus, Lincoln managed to work around the Rothschilds. But less than two months before the end of the American Civil War, President Lincoln was assassinated. You might notice another trend, the trend of dying figureheads anytime they go against the money trust, or the main belief that the majority of the world's financial wealth and political power could be controlled by a powerful few. Now that we've laid out their basic strategy, which is to cause wars or help them out, give them a little nudge through some provocation resulting in maybe a crisis or two, loans are dished out at exorbitant interest rates on both sides of the wars. Then when both of those governments can't repay those debts, the Rothschild Bank calls in the loans and takes possession installing a central bank. In 1913, the same year the Rothschild funded Anti-Defamation League was founded, the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the United States, was conceived. It is neither federal or owned by the government. The Federal Reserve is privately owned, which means it generates private wealth. Guess who benefits? Not the American people. One year after the creation of the Federal Reserve, World War I began, pitting the Allied and Central Powers against each other. Guess who was funding both sides again? You guessed it. And the result was the fall of the German, Russian, Ottoman, and Austro-Hungarian empires. But who cares if there's money to be made off both of the winning and losing sides? After all, it brings us closer to a one-world government, doesn't it? And a one-world government means a central global bank. In 1917, through the Balfour Declaration, the British government expressed their support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. The letter was written to none other than Baron Lionel Walter Rothschild. With the Versailles Treaty of 1919, Britain was entrusted with the temporary administration of Palestine. Now I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. With the Rothschild bankers funding both the Axis and the Allies, the Second World War brought us closer to a one-world government with the establishment of the United Nations. In 1963, even though war was over, the bloodshed hadn't stopped. On June 4th, President John F. Kennedy signed an executive order which returned to the U.S. government the power to issue currency, which meant they didn't have to go through the Rothschild-owned Federal Reserve. Six months later, JFK was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. In the following decades, central banks continued to pop up across the world, with the European Central Bank set up in 1998 in Frankfurt, the city from which the Rothschilds' banking dynasty began. And after 9-11, the United States declared a war we've really not been able to get out of, an endless war on terrorism that the world is frightened into with each seemingly random terrorist attack. Hatred and fear fuels each side of the war, but only one entity funds both sides, keeping each rival distracted from focusing their attention on whose war this really is. I wonder what will happen to us, to people like you and me, when there are finally no more wars to occupy us. Magicians can only enchant their audience if the audience is unaware of how the trick is executed. If more people knew about how the shadow government operated, then maybe we could channel our energy into creating solutions for the future. But that's the thing, we're too busy paying away our debts, working at jobs we hate, so we can spend a little time with the people we love. We can never truly free ourselves without being able to name who rules over us. What difference at this point does it make? Those weapons of mass destruction gotta be somewhere. Nope, no weapons over there. We should not argue in the context of yesterday. We should really first analyze how the world has dramatically changed and is changing in an accelerating way. 
I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. Something that I'm breathing, telling me to sleep in. Fix me on my lids like nothing gets done. Living by a bad truth, swallow it like who knew. Marching to the drums like pop, pop, pop. Sliding by the beaches, God, I have a secret. Life is plain peaches, tell my body my secret. Drowning at the teaching, God, I have a secret. I'm just a fake silhouette. Avoiding every threat Internet friends, Grace here. I was thinking about all these CEOs who've been stepping down in 2020 and also about the stock market and how it's plunged within recent weeks. As we have this economic stimulus package headed our way and the Fed is pumping trillions of dollars into our economy, I thought what better time to discuss a family who is intimately tied to the dollar. This family is as rich, if not richer, than the Rockefellers, yet they are not a household name. So let's spend this video talking about the Schiff family. Oddly enough, in order to speak about one of the richest families in America who hardly anyone knows about, we have to travel back to the Middle Ages, to a Jewish ghetto, where the Schiff family and the most notorious banking family, the Rothschild family, lived under one roof and continued to for centuries, intermarrying and essentially acting as one family. Which is where we meet Jacob Schiff, who was born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1847. At age 18, he set sail for New York, where he quickly made connections and moved up the ranks of the American banking industry. The Rothschilds' now American cousin honed his finance skills and became a member of Kuhn Loeb, a European Jewish investment firm who emerged as one of the most influential firms of the industrial era. Having financed top industry tycoons including John D. Rockefeller and his expansion of Standard Oil, Jacob Schiff married into Kuhn Loeb, becoming head of the firm yet never changing the name. And additionally, Schiff became the director of the National City Bank of New York, Wells Fargo, and the Union Pacific Railroad. In 1907, he launched the Jewish Immigrants Information Bureau to encourage European Jewish immigration to the United States and successfully devised the Galveston Plan in which European organizations recruited Jewish individuals and transported them to Texas. While Schiff managed to change immigration laws for one group, he actively suppressed immigrants of other ethnicities and nationalities. Also on his resume, Schiff was one of the major financiers of the Bolshevik Revolution, which massacred millions of Christians across Russia. Once established as a financial titan, this Rothschild cousin quickly implemented the family formula. Jacob Schiff, alongside his brother-in-law, Paul Warburg, waged a relentless campaign for an American central bank. This banking crusade included giving speeches in front of New York's Chamber of Commerce, advocating for currency reform, with Jacob Schiff delivering a number of these speeches, making his intent perfectly clear. The main opposition to the Fed conveniently kicked the bucket a year before it was created. Rival millionaires like Jacob Astor, Isidore Strauss, and Benjamin Guggenheim sank along with the Titanic in 1912. JP Morgan was supposed to be on board but canceled at the last minute. What a coincidence, right? With Congress eager to take leave for the Christmas holidays, they passed the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 on December 23rd which called for the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank, a central bank of the United States that would oversee the nation's monetary policy. With the catch being that the Federal Reserve wasn't even part of the federal government, but a foreign banking system that doesn't even print the dollar bill. In 1933, Americans were required to deliver their gold to a Federal Reserve agent under the threat of criminal penalties. 
Meanwhile, the Schiff family maintained their status as banking titans, but eventually branched out to build a media empire. The granddaughter of Jacob Schiff, Dorothy Schiff, was owner and publisher of the New York Post for nearly 40 years. Also of note, the president of the Federal Reserve, Eugene Meyer, bought the Washington Post. Today, the Schiff family is as rich as ever and still highly connected, marrying into politics with a Schiff descendant wedding Vice President Al Gore's daughter. And while they've since divorced, you can see other members of the family intermingle between politics and Hollywood. To conclude here, we have a pattern that the Schiff family helped establish, and they've financially profited off of it ever since, making them one of the richest families in America. In 1913, a criminal cartel took control of a nation's monetary system. Respective families of this cartel bought and built media outlets, as well as purchased politicians to push the U.S. until World War I. Both sides of every war were and are funded by the same bankers. Fast forward to the Roaring Twenties. War was over and all the people with a little extra cash on hand got back into the financial market. Then the banks crashed the market once again, which prompted the Great Depression of the 30s, in which banking cartels bought up everything for pennies and to stabilize the economy, a problem they themselves created and already had a manufactured solution in place, rolled out the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. Then came World War II which was promoted to every American through media channels the banking cartel owned and operated. Now we copy-paste, copy-paste the same formula for the Korean War, Vietnam, Gulf War, Afghanistan, Iraq, interventions in Syria, Yemen, and Libya. All of these wars are bankers' wars, sold to the American public through media on false pretenses. And what needs to be made absolutely clear is that the motivation behind this practice, this pattern, isn't just a magic piece of paper. Now I can already anticipate some of the reactions that I might receive as a result of pointing out someone's religious affiliation, whether that be Christian, Mormon, Muslim, Wahhabi, whatever, no one ever has a problem with it until I mention Talmudic Judaism, which is taught through a rabbinical text called the Babylonian Talmud and was compiled in the year 500. The Talmud says some pretty interesting things about the treatment of Gentiles, but Talmudic rabbis refute this observation by saying anti-Semites take these direct quotes about Gentiles and even the Talmudic view of Christ out of context. From Bethlehem to Babylon or modern day Iraq is over 600 miles, quite a haul from where Judaism has its roots. At the core of Judaism is the covenant with Moses and the covenant with Abraham. The holy text is the Torah. There are plenty of Jews who would not touch the Talmud with a 10-foot pole. They strictly abide by the Torah. I am not talking about those people. It's incredibly important that I make this distinction. I am not talking about your neighbors. I am not talking about the people you see in your grocery store. I am not talking about you, a normal person who is just living your life. What I am talking about is a mindset, not even an ethnicity, because no one here can help how or where they were born. But what is within our control is how we treat people and what we do with this time we are given. So I'm talking about the continuum of Babylon, not Jerusalem. People who see themselves as one tribe to rule over all the others. A people who have claimed this religious identity but are clearly of Eastern European descent or Ashkenazi ancestry, who are thought to have made conversions to Judaism Judaism while under the Khazarian kingdom around the same time the Babylonian Talmud was being compiled, and a lot of these folks ended up in Poland and then Germany. So anyway, I can already feel the ADL putting me on a list, but it has to be said, not from a place of hatred, but from a place of hope for humanity. All the things I've covered in this video and the events we are seeing play out on the world stage, even right now, today, is the logical culmination of Babylon debt slavery. The name Babylon can be translated to the gates of the gods, not God with a big G, but gods with a little g, whom some might call fallen angels. The Bible talks about Babylon a lot, calling it the dwelling place of demons, a place of death, slavery, and blood rituals. Compound interest is literally Babylonian mathematics. It's inscribed on ancient tablets. Usury is Babylon. In other words, ancient Babylon was all about loaning you 50 bucks if you paid them back $75. These practices yielded a society in which 80 to 90% of the population had nothing 
a tiny fraction of the population had something, and 0.00001% of people had everything. The majority of the population was composed of people who were working just to barely financially get by. Basically just working to be able to afford to live. This is debt slavery. Can we draw any parallels to modern society here? Oh, and by the way, did I say Palestine or Egypt was all about loaning you $50 as long as you paid back $75? No, I didn't, so please spare me on accusations of anti-Semitism. America was never supposed to be home to this debt slavery system. The American founders talked about this a lot. America was intended to be an even playing field where everyone could succeed not lose their houses over fluctuating interest rates in a manufactured mortgage crisis. Do you hear how absurd that sounds? The money was always supposed to be backed in something tangible like gold or silver, but instead we have magic paper money backed by nothing except the confidence to exchange it for goods and services. And our whole financial system is controlled by people who have no allegiance to us. They use compound interest tricks with fake money that is backed by absolutely nothing. They can print as much of it as they want and flood our markets with dollars under the guise of saving us. But you cannot save someone from a problem that you yourself created. You are not the hero here, you are, you are the villain. So to put it all into perspective, a Rothschild cousin came to America and made quick work of overturning America's monetary system. In 1910, in total and complete secrecy, Schiff and his buddies traveled to an island off the coast of Georgia called Jekyll Island, where the Rockefellers already had a residence. And there just so happened to be a huge Native American burial ground in their front yard. There was a Native American tribe who once inhabited Georgia's islands. And historians have noted that an ancient Canaanite altar once existed on Jekyll Island and was the location of ritual sacrifice. A tidbit which is used to explain why the original members of the Fed chose Jekyll Island of all places to plan the country's monetary policy. In fact, in 1892, the Atlanta Constitution reported they had found a mound in that area that contained one frame of a nine foot tall human who must have been a very near relative of old Goliath, which is a direct quote. <laughs> Goliath in the Bible is recorded as a nine foot tall giant and biblical scholars regard Goliath as a Nephilim descendant of Canaan. People tend to label this sort of talk as a bunch of malarkey, just total fantasy, but think about it. People have died, are dying, and will die for a dollar, a piece of paper backed by absolutely nothing tangible, nothing. Just open up your wallet and look at the iconography on the dollar bill. Just pull out your wallet and look at a dollar bill. We have a pyramid with an eye on top of it. And underneath, Novus Ordo Seclorum, meaning the new secular order or new order for the ages. These visual metaphors relate to the same kind of debt slavery, usury, and compound interest that America was never supposed to have. And historically, this banking cartel has silenced anyone who has challenged their control. Like Napoleon with his Bank of France or Lincoln with his greenback or even JFK and Gaddafi tried to introduce the gold air. Look at what happened to these people. And now Trump deals with them. And there have been moments throughout his presidency where he's been incredibly critical of the Fed. And even as recently as yesterday, the Fed admitted to manufacturing this economic crisis we face during this period of pandemic. So it will be very telling to see how Trump responds. And just to wrap it all up here, Mystery Babylon isn't such a mystery, is it? The Federal Reserve has created unimaginable private wealth like the familial wealth of the Schiff family. But like I said before, it's not all about that dollar dollar bill, y'all. It's about control. And control is directly at odds with freedom, one of America's most cherished values. These are the families who sit on top of everything, who don't want to be noticed, but there are no families or corporations or governments higher than them as the governments and corporations are completely at their mercy. What difference at this point does it make? Those weapons of mass destruction gotta be somewhere. Nope, no weapons over there. We should not argue in the context of yesterday. We should really first analyze how the world has dramatically changed and is changing in an accelerating way. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. Something that I'm breathing, telling me to sleep in. Fix me on my lids like nothing gets done. Living by a bad truth, swallow it like who knew. Marching to the drums like pop, pop, pop. Sliding by the beaches, gotta have a secret. Life is plain peaches, tell nobody my secret.
internet friends. Not too long ago, those who sought total and complete control over a society did so not on the basis of exemplifying exceptional character or extraordinary ability, but they operated under what was known as the divine right of kings, or the assertion that a king, viewed as a god in his own respect, was not subject to the will of his people, but only to be judged by God himself. These mighty men of old were successful in convincing others that God's mandate flowed through their veins, and that everyday people should spend the best years of their lives working to secure the social order of their realm. And for a time, this was how the world worked. Documented in history books with the blood of the ordinary used as the ink to write a version of the past. But in a post-American revolution society, it would seem like the divine rights of kings would be a distant memory. But is the reality really so? Do certain bloodlines still hold power within our current government system? And if all US presidents are somehow united in blood, does that mean our leaders are really elected by the people? Or does that mean they're selected by the few? Recently, there's been a surge of renewed interest in a story that hit the mainstream a number of years ago, when Brijan, a 12-year-old student, discovered that all the United States presidents, with the exception of one, were all related to each other, linked by one distinct royal descendant. Brijan reportedly completed this project with a little help from her grandparents, and the one president they were unable to link to the common descendant was Martin Van Buren the eighth president of the United States, but the first president to actually be born a citizen of the United States. Unlike the seven presidents before him who were born British subjects. At five foot six, Van Buren's nickname was the Little Magician because he was quite the compelling guy, or at least Yale's skull and bones not so secret society must have thought so, as Van Buren's skull is rumored to reside within the school's tombs. Brijan traced all of the presidents back to King John of the House Plantagenet. The House of Plantagenet, with the surname having etymological roots in Old English, meaning sprig of bloom or young tree. According to the legend that's still being circulated today, the Plantagenets were descended from a demon, which served as an explanation of their ferocity and seemingly supernatural success on the battlefield. King John's reputation doesn't really improve from his familial lore, you were probably introduced to him as a child, as the villain in the tales of Robin Hood, as the ruler of a vast international empire who held the most important and powerful dominion over Europe at that time. There is next to nothing flattering written about King John. During the age of chivalry, he was callous and cruel, orchestrating one bloody betrayal after another, relishing in the conflict he created in his own court, starving his captives to death, and most of all, oppressing his subjects. One of the lovely fairy tales taught within the confines of the classroom assures us that the era of kings being able to do whatever they pleased, whenever they pleased, ended with King John, as he's most known for granting the Magna Carta, a document that was based on the Charter of Liberties and whipped up by the Archbishop of Canterbury as a practical solution to a political problem. You see, King John had managed to annoy everyone with his disastrous military campaigns and he specifically ticked off his barons because he attempted to extort money from them. So as a peace treaty of sorts, the Magna Carta served to place limits on the power of the crown. 
theoretically ensuring King John's actions would not be repeated by a future ruler, and to this day still symbolizes the rights of a subject against the power of a tyrant. Even though the document definitely didn't apply to all people at that time, just nobility. Sorry poor people, you lose again. But nonetheless, it was the first step towards the justice system we know today. King John granted the Magna Carta in 1215, but by the next year, he had kicked the bucket, with his legacy being that he managed to lose the empire his family had attained. His funeral broke tradition as he wasn't buried with his crown, and records of his death indicate that he was little mourned and mentioned that his subjects thought him to be suffering in the torments of hell. Even his queen abandoned four of their five children and wasted no time to start a new life with a lover from her past, never to publicly mention her late husband again. Pretty spicy, right? Curiously, in 1797, King John's body was exhumed and the townspeople pilfered parts of his remains, keeping them as souvenirs. Comment below if you would have kept a piece of King John as a souvenir. Your honesty, as always, is appreciated. Before a seventh grader connected all of the presidents back to King John, there was a guy making headlines in his attempt to discover if and how bloodlines played into power. As the son of a Washington, D.C. attorney, this Harvard graduate, classmate of Ted Kennedy and ex-husband of a French countess, Harold Brooks Baker often made comments about the British royal family to the press and advocated his most royal candidate theory with each United States presidential election, with the theory being that the winning candidate would always have the greatest percentage of royal blood. His theory held water up until the 2004 presidential election, when he guessed that John Kerry would be the winner, given that he had more royal blood than George W. Bush. Brooks Baker kicked the bucket a few months later, but his theory lived on. Much like Bridge Ann's project, the media drooled all over themselves whenever Brooks Baker spoke. And the propagation of his most royal candidate theory has served to push another theory, that presidents are selected, not elected, and specifically their selection is based on their pedigree. To reiterate, the basis of this theory is that a candidate does not achieve presidency because of their ambition, charisma, skill set, or ability to get the most people to vote for them. The candidate ascends to presidency because they are selected by their bloodline, a bloodline that can be traced back to House of Plantagenet. Critics of the most royal candidate theory have claimed that the odds of any given person being distantly related to royalty are remarkably high, with one estimate suggesting that more than 150 million Americans are of royal descent. So there's quite a few of us who can trace our lineage back to royalty. One model uses a formula that was created from research at Yale and aimed to find Europe's most common ancestor. What they discovered is that if you took the entire population of Europe and plugged it into this formula, you'd have to go back around 1300 years or 46 generations to find the generation that contains Europe's most common ancestor. And that ancestor would likely be someone of royal blood since that family tree has survived. Meaning that, with this model, everyone in Europe is descended from Charlemagne. It should be noted, though, that the House of Plantagenet is quite a bit more recent than the reign of Charlemagne. Furthermore, if it is true that an estimated one-third of Americans are said to be descended from the Plantagenets, you would think the number of American presidents who can trace their bloodline back to King John would actually be less than 98%, as Bridge Ann's model suggests. But actually, it's more than 98%, since Donald Trump is related to King John as well. And it was discovered after Bridge Ann's media blitz that Martin Van Buren's ancestry can be traced back to King John's mother. So that puts us at 100% of United States presidents who are tied back to the House of Plantagenet, which is interesting for such a small sample size. That being said, I personally have a problem with the most royal candidate theory. Hello, this is my opinion, both Bridge Ann's project and the most royal candidate theory rely on something that most politicians don't have. Honesty. Honesty about who's your daddy and baby mamas throughout time. But beyond that, does the royal candidate theory and Bridge Ann's extracurriculars have any meaningful significance in deciphering what is truly playing out on the world stage? In my opinion, while I find this topic to be endlessly fascinating and I could happily make 20 videos on this topic, the line of questioning feels a bit misdirected. 
If you really believe presidents are selected, not elected, then why aren't we discussing the bloodlines of those who are doing the selecting? Who are the people we aren't talking about? What are their motives? What is their belief system? Sure, the puppet is interesting, but how about who's pulling those strings? What do you think, internet friends? Are presidents selected or are they elected? As always, I look forward to your comments. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, and supporting my channel on Patreon. Bye! Included in the list of potential godfathers for his son Harry was none other than Jimmy Savile, English TV and radio personality host of Jim'll Fix It. Charles was so close with Savile, in fact, that he asked him for advice over the appointment of a senior aide for him and Princess Diana. But did you know that it was actually Charles's Twitter account who marked the launch of The Great Reset? Hey internet friends, we've all heard the saying, birds of a feather flock together, meaning that people who are alike, sharing similar qualities, interests, goals, and extracurriculars, well, they tend to hang out together. Do you agree that a man can be judged by the company he keeps? Or is guilt by association just that, baseless and misleading? Today, we're gonna be talking about King Charles III's inner circle in their scandals the ones we didn't have a chance to cover in previous videos. These close connections are important, especially with King Charles III being crowned the woke king of the New World Order. His reign affects us all. So what does the character of the inner circle reflect upon our king? First, we must discuss Lord Louis Mountbatten, a high-ranking British commander, the uncle to Prince Philip, and second cousin of Queen Elizabeth II because the royal family is historically super inbred. And Mountbatten was the great uncle of King Charles III, and he was known to everybody in the royal family as Uncle Dicky. While born in England, Mountbatten came from a family called the Battenbergs, a family of German descent. Just like the current reigning royal house, House of Windsor, they technically have German ancestry, but British identity. Prince Philip and his uncle had a close relationship, as Uncle Mountbatten took on a father figure role after Philip's family was exiled from Greece in the 1920s. And it was also his uncle who reportedly introduced Prince Philip to Elizabeth when she was 13 and not yet queen. Prince Charles described his uncle as the grandfather he never had, his mentor, and he was so influential in the royal family that Prince William and Kate Middleton named their youngest son Louis after Uncle Mountbatten. After Uncle Dickie died in an IRA assassination bombing in 1979, rumors about his extracurricular swirled. And in 2019, an FBI dossier released through the Freedom of Information Act revealed that he and his wife were, quote, persons of extremely low morals, end quote. And Mountbatten had a perversion for young boys. American intelligence officers began piling this dossier back in 1944, and one of their reports detailed that, quote, Baroness Desi's stated that Mountbatten was known to be a homosexual with a perversion for young boys and was an unfit man to direct any sort of military operations because of this condition. She stated that further that his wife, Lady Mountbatten, was considered equally erratic. And E.E. E. Conroy, the head of the New York FBI field office, added in the file that the Baroness appears to have no special motive in making the above statements, end quote. Mountbatten's preference for young boys, not men or women, was confirmed by his driver in a 1987 interview, who said he used to transport young boys ages 8 to 12 to Lord Mountbatten, who subdued them with brandy-spiked lemonade. Where'd they get the boys, and what happened to the boys after? Certainly they were old enough to report this type of abuse to the police, but... 
Apparently they didn't. So did they get killed after? Why does no one ask stuff like this? Do we not ask because we already know the answer? So it comes as no surprise that prolific pedo sadist and TV host of Jim will Fix It, Jimmy Savile, told reporters that he was introduced into the royal family in 1966 through Lord Mountbatten. I told you in my previous video that Prince Charles considered Savile his best friend at one point, and Savile was on the list for godfathers for Prince Charles's son. And Prince Charles even looked to Savile for relationship advice for his marriage to Princess Diana. Savile wrote a PR handbook for the royal family and regularly advised Prince Charles in political matters. And it is through Savile's royal ties that he was afforded key positions at hospitals and psychiatric wards, where he had his own set of keys to these hospitals, his own rooms under the roofs, so he had 24-7 access to his victims, children and adults alike living or dead. In response to relaying this information, I had hundreds of comments that said there was no way Prince Charles knew what Savile got up to. He was a criminal mastermind. Yeah, right. You know that Savile was vetted and followed by British intelligence. They knew exactly what he was up to, and he was probably allowed into the inner circle because of it. Don't be a dunce. Savile was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II at Buckingham Palace in 1990, making him Sir Jimmy Savile. Just like Prince Charles awarded honorary knighthood to Kevin Spacey in 2016 for his, quote, service to the theater. The only difference is we found out all of Jimmy Savile's pedo and necrophilia allegations post-mortem. Meanwhile, Kevin Spacey's charges arrived while he was still alive and kicking. One year later, in 2017, Spacey was charged for assaulting a 14-year-old boy in Britain. All in all, Spacey has been accused of sexual misconduct by more than a dozen men. It should be noted that three of Kevin Spacey's accusers have died shortly under mysterious circumstances after they spoke out about his behavior. Do y'all remember after these allegations, Kevin Spacey released that really weird video where he was by the fireplace and at the very end of the video, he said he'll kill his enemies with kindness and there was ominous music. I'll roll the clip. The next time someone does something you don't like, you can go on the attack, but you can also hold your fire and do the unexpected. You can kill them with kindness. Fun fact, just like King Charles, Kevin Spacey is a member of the World Economic Forum. I wish we could go one video without talking about the World Economic Forum. Kevin Spacey is part of the Great Reset. I covered the connection between the Great Reset, World Economic Forum, and King Charles, the woke king, in my previous video, so I'll link it below. And just like King Charles's brother, Prince Andrew, there's about a million pictures of Kevin Spacey and Ghislaine Maxwell with his links to Epstein and Lolita Express. In this photo we're looking at here, Ghislaine Maxwell sits on a throne at Buckingham Palace alongside actor Kevin Spacey. That's the caption. It is believed to have been taken in 2002. And just to be fair, just to note this, there's a big difference between a celebrity taking a picture with another celebrity at an event and the obvious comfort of two people being photographed together who very much seem like they're around each other all the time. As I covered in the previous video, the royal family took some heat from Prince Andrew and his tarnished reputation. And of course, Prince Andrew was caught hanging out with Epstein after Epstein was convicted. Additionally, we all know that Prince Andrew stayed at Epstein's house and rode on the infamous Lolita Express to Epstein's island. His alleged victims have spoken out against him, and as a result, his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, forced him to return his military affiliations and was excused of any royal duties in January of 2022. But don't forget, Prince Andrew used 12 million pounds of taxpayer money to settle his sexual assault case. So Prince Andrew basically just gets a slap on the wrist and he wore his full military regalia to the queen's funeral. He groped his daughter during the funeral, but the 22 year old man who heckled Prince Andrew at his mom's funeral was arrested and charged with a breach of the peace. Disgusting! Oh yeah, I've done nothing wrong. That powerful men should be allowed to commit sexual crimes and get away with it. The royal family murdered and plundered the peasants to colonize more territories and expand their empire not so many generations ago. 
Do you really think abusing some children matters to them? I demonstrated in this video that that practice is most likely normalized to them, as they have all been exposed to generational abuse. And do you really think they care about you? They're subjects. It's clear they see themselves as above us. Otherwise, why declare themselves rulers, royalty, kings, and queens in this age? They are above the law. Their actions have no consequence. They can pay to make their problems go away. And that's just the reality of it. That's their history. They married child brides, married their cousins, chopped people's heads off a couple hundred years ago, beheaded queens and all that. What's a little car crash in a tunnel to make a problem go away when this is normalized behavior in your family? Royalists in my comment section will tell me that I have no manners or decorum for showing you the reality of King Charles III just a few days after the death of Queen Elizabeth. They'll say that the House of Windsor are just figureheads, nothing more. So why do I care who's king? I'm American after all, shouldn't I just mind my own business? Don't we have our own problems here that I need to focus on? It's clear as day that King Charles III is the king of the New World Order. It's why he declared the Great Reset. It's why he's the woke prince. His reign affects us all, as he influences elections and policies worldwide. Do these connections, events, and allegations not at least warrant questioning? Ultimately, I have no regrets in exposing the reality of King Charles III. My only regret is that I don't have enough time, energy, or resources to roast him more thoroughly while the bought and paid for media sings his praises. What difference at this point does it make? Those weapons of mass destruction gotta be somewhere. Nope, no weapons over there. We should not argue in the context of yesterday. We should really first analyze how the world has dramatically changed and is changing in an accelerating way. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. Something that I'm breathing, telling me to sleep in. Fix me on my lids like nothing gets done. Living by a bad truth, swallow it like who knew. Marching to the drums like pop, 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 Sliding by the beaches, God, I have a secret. Life is plain peaches, tell me that my secret. Drowning at the teaching, God, I have a secret. I'm just a fake silhouette. Avoiding every threat